Well, I want to welcome you to Amavati this afternoon. The um, the listed topic for reflection, uh, spiritual beauty, which is something to sometimes. Uh, these words, both of them, are, can be seen in very superficial ways. Uh, I find it in, in a spiritual development, one really needs to to kind of redefine one's the meaning of words, because so much of our language is uh, habitual, and uh, oftentimes we we use words without appreciating. Uh, some of the more subtle meanings or uh, values that that these convey. And so, something like the word "spiritual" can can be uh, kind of just the sentiment of the mind, or it can be related to spirits. Uh, it can be related to different interpretations of spirits. And uh, beauty is a word that. Uh, also is used for anything that uh, that attracts. But uh, on spiritual plane, when one is developing a, uh, the the life, or say, to realize an, uh, the ultimate reality, then beauty, uh, the word beauty, conveys something that is is uh, say truly beautiful, not not just uh, say attractive. It's perfectly beautiful. Be any beauty in any of its forms then is always a a reminder of ultimate reality, like the say flowers can be seen as as uh, symbolically as that which reminds us of of ultimate beauty or truth or goodness. We can regard anything good in our lives or all that is true. Good and beautiful, uh, even though in it, in the aspects that we experience it, it's it's temporary or impermanent. In its significance, it it we can relate it to ultimate realization or perfect beauty, perfect goodness. In the life we live as a, as a sense sense being then we're our perceptions that we create around the things that that we uh, contact through through senses we we can uh, we can kind of fix them with uh, attitudes and preferences and biases and when the when the mind becomes rigid and fixed and uh, kind of uh, paralyzed uh, within just uh, our ability to perceive, then this is uh, this, this, this uh, uh, al- doesn't allow us to a full realization of truth. So, with meditation, the aim is to is to lessen the power of the of this force of habit, to kind of to let it fade away, to to relinquish the habitual tendencies, so that our conscious experience and Wisdom is then informing us about ultimate or or spiritual beauty. We're relating, we're contacting, we're realizing that which is uh, perfect and beautiful, true and good, but not in the sense of a condition anymore. It's a it's it's a realization uh, of of that which is of, of beyond the condition. The conditioned realm can only point to that. Can only if we if we if we meditate upon the conditioned realm and see it in its impermanent uh, characteristic, then that impermanent nature of conditions will take us to that ultimate realization. And when we talk about ultimate realization, then we 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 really have to g- even give up the words like beauty and goodness and truth. 
because they still get in the way. But as, say, symbolic pointing at ultimate realization, at, ult at, at perfection, at liberation, uh, in the Christian sense of salvation or enlightenment, these words are, are, are the realization of Nibbana. These, these are usually in... Uh, uh, term, kind of dynamic terms that, that convey a, 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 something that happens, something that, that is realized rather than something that is attained or grasped or perceived and, and, and can be uh, fixed and, and held to in, in, in any way whatsoever. So the enlightenment is, the, is through receptivity and relinquishment Non and through non-attachment that we realize ultimate reality. In this realm, that, in the human realm that we live in, uh, say at this, this age that we are uh, involved with, the, the consumer society, as they say, or, or the materialistic society, uh, or just uh, the the attitudes of modern humanity with with its technology and its its uh, exalting our ability to reason and use rational thought, uh, where the 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 self interest becomes the important one. We become overly concerned with ourselves. We become we become inflated. Uh, and we exaggerate our our personalities. And this age is is one where we we acquire a lot of information about all kinds of things. Uh, just uh, the the available information that everybody can read and write here in Britain. Every uh, there's so many possible ways to to learn and get information about anything that you could possibly be interested in. But for ultimate realization, all of it has to be relinquished. The Buddhist scriptures included the conventions, the monastic form, the the uh, the uh, tradition. And I think this is one thing that uh, is very uh, difficult for people to comprehend, because when we connect relinquishment or abandonment. Uh, as a kind of negative act, as a, something to, of getting rid of, as throwing out, as, as rejection. And so when we, we talk of, of letting go or abandoning or relinquishing even the monastic form or the uh, Buddhist tradition or Buddhist uh, religion or the teachers or whatever, uh, that we regard with, with great reverence and great respect, then the, the conditioned uh, mind tends to logically see it only as an act of rejection or throwing out, abandoning in the sense of, of getting rid of. Just like we tend to equate, uh, the, we see that the life we live, we're so identified with with our own bodies and our own sense experiences and our own personalities. Conscious, with the consciousness that we have, we, we give it uh, such a, a personal, uh, it gets such impact on us as, as a real person, something that, that when it dies, that's the end. It's very, it's very easy for us to see that when somebody dies, that's the end of them, that they're, that that's the end of their life, that life is ended. And so death for us, if we're not reflective and not uh, investigating our own experience of life within, before this, this formation dies, and if, we're, and if we're looking at it in the right way, we examine and investigate it as an experience, as the realities of, that we are having within this form, then we begin to, to see that death is merely the, the end of, 
of the consciousness in this particular form. We begin to sense, a sense beyond a sense, or an intuition. Something knows that that that, that, that because somebody dies or something ends, that, that that's all right. That's the way, uh, that's the way of all conditions. That's normal, that's natural, that's the way it should be. Because we, we no longer relate life to a particular form. Life then doesn't die, conditions come and go. And the, the forms change. They, they, they are born, they develop, reach their peak, they deteriorate and die. That's, that's the, the natural sequence of events. But they say, then, but life, that's not the end of life, is it? That's the end of consciousness for that particular form. But when we invest the forms with all the significance, all the, we, we give them so much significance and importance in our lives, then we do suffer enormously when we lose the forms that we become identified with and attached to. When the things that we, we, we empower with, with our attachments, then when they are separated from us, when they die or they're taken away or disappear, we can only feel uh, loss because we, we're not really appreciating life as a whole experience. We're merely depending on various forms for a sense of security and fulfillment through being attached, through being identified, through, through being uh, uh, related to th this form and, uh, and that form and that condition, that person. There's something in us that also wants to speculate about ultimate reality. Uh, people can, say, can give it a, a, a totally positive uh, uh, quality, that it's the supreme happiness, or it's the, 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 the happiest of the lot. It's, the, it's total bliss. It, it's eternal rapture. Uh, and these things, these kind of, of uh, perceptions are certainly inspiring to the mind, aren't they? To think that, that, that life is just pure bliss, eternal, happy, pleasant, forever and ever. Because our experience of life within, within this form isn't that way, is it? This form is a form that suffers. This is an experience of suffering, the human, the human state. And so any, any kind of rapture or joy or happiness that we experience, we tend to, that tends to create a strong desire to, to try to get more of it, to try to hang on, to increase it, to enlarge upon it, to, to hang on to it as long as possible. And then... When we lose it, even no matter how long we, we might be able to hold on or keep that going, it changes because this, this realm is one where we experience change. We can't sustain anything uh, in a conscious experience for very long. We have to... Uh, accept the fact that, that, that and this is the way it is in this human state. And the suffering then is what the Buddha pointed to. It's something to understand rather than to uh, go around looking for these uh, more blissful experiences as, as, the, as the kind of ultimate religious uh, realization. Just contemplate your own life. Just what it is to to have a human body. Is it, uh, uh, is it a totally blissful, rapturous experience? And uh, it's, you know, it doesn't take much thought to realize it. it it's that this, this human body is a very limited form, very sensitive form, and, and, it's, and it presents us with a lot of discomfort and pain and unpleasantness. 
not to put it down and to blame it and think that it should be some other way, but to just admit that this is, this is what human life is about. It's hunger and thirst and it's aging, it's separation from the loved. It's, uh, admittedly, we have the other. We have good health and vigor and, and meeting with the loved and, and uh, bliss and rapture and joy. This is what we would would like to to have on a, on a permanent basis. But in this in this form, the wisdom comes through accepting the the suffering that we experience, through understanding it, through a willingness to to accept all of it. And what I found is that there is a a, a a joy that that springs from. In, uh, up in one's heart when you accept the whole of it, the whole lot of it. Uh, the suffering, the, the good along with the, the bad along with the good, the, the failures along with the successes. When you, when you determine to accept the whole of it, then, then one is no longer uh, say, thinking that there's some way, something wrong with, with you, something wrong with me, when say that what we love disappears or what we be depend on for our happiness changes or, or, or moves away from us, separates from us. This total embracing of life, the, the willingness to experience and to, to accept pain, suffering, and pleasure and happiness. I mean, th those are not so difficult to accept. It's the other side, isn't it? That, that frighten us, that we resist, and that we dread. When we talk about this life being a realm of suffering, that's not, that's not a value judgment. That's not putting it down. Sometimes the Buddhists get accused of being negative and pessimistic because they say things like that. They say all things, all, everything is unsatisfactory. All conditions are impermanent. All is, is suffering. And of course, taken on the level of, of a value judgment, that is a very negative thing to say. In some ways, you're putting down everything. I remember thinking, well, you know, the, the, ha then happiness is suffering. And it sounds like, like, you know, sour grapes. It sounds like, you know, you're just saying, you're just trying to, to paint everything one color and dismiss everything by saying it's all miserable, all suffering. But recognize that that, that, is, that, that isn't the, how the Buddha taught. That might be how you, you interpret it or how your mind uh, translates those teachings, but in in the practice and realization of truth, the the recognition of suffering isn't isn't in in any way uh, a judgment against anything. It's merely a realization, an understanding of that of our human state and what what the what to expect from this life in this form. Now, when, when I expect, say, when I look into the future, say, I think, well, I'm getting older, and the problems that come with that are increasingly more apparent. Things change in many ways that you, you, you don't want them to. Uh, you, you can see that this is a time where um, the whole planet seems to be going through the throes of, of upheavals, of all kinds of uh, uh, conditions that we no longer have can keep under control. Uh, the doomsday predictions and the and the uh, the kind of misery that we hear about through the news, or even what we're seeing or what we're experiencing. But not a pessimistic outlook, but recognize that that all of this is something to maybe look at in a different way. And this is, this is why 
I think many of you come to places like this, why you meditate, why you find uh, some attraction or inclination towards the Buddhist teachings, because intuitively you sense that, that, this, that this might be a way of looking and understanding which will help you to deal with the uh, experiences of your life, which will allow you to learn the lessons you need to learn and get the information you need to have and help you to respond to life in a way that, that will be skillful and appropriate rather than just reactive, frightened, bored and, and weary, thre threatened and frightened by, by what you're, you're experiencing or what you hear about or what you're, you see. When we investigate our own human state more and more, when we're watchful and mindful of it, one thing we, we began with the breath, with just the breathing of your body. And that's such an ordinary thing in that uh, we, we, we don't give it much significance unless, it, unless we're having trouble with breathing. If we're asthmatic or something, then each breath is a, is a struggle and is very important to us. But say the normal breathing of just uh, inhalation, exhalation usually goes on uh, and, is, and, and uh, does not, uh, we, we do not feel any, any interest in it or give it much attention until it becomes uh, painful or, or uncomfortable. But the breath itself is a, is a, is a, 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 like a spirit, isn't it? It's a sense of it's a when we're breathing in, we're breathing. There's a, a sense of inspiring. This sense of spiritus and breath and that which say when we when we inhale, we think we're, we're bringing into our body the breath. We're filling ourselves up with this with this spiritus. We're inhaling, and and this sense of fullness that we get from inhaling, then then when we exhale, there's a sense of, of fullness and completion, and then the need to to that, that this form has and its limitation to exhale. You can't just inhale; you have to exhale. One conditions the other; they depend on each other, because in this form. Uh, this, is, this is the way it is. A form like this can only take in so much and then it has to expel. And this, uh, just this alone, we, we begin, if we contemplate the sense of inhaling as an experience and the experience of exhaling, both have their, uh, their lesson to teach us something to observe, something to reflect upon, something to, to try to, to notice, to note what it is. Now none of us want to just inhale and not do the other, or just exhale, I mean that's absurd. And too much of a good thing is, is usually uh, a disaster, so, so that when we breathe in a normal way, when we're relaxed and just breathing, letting the breath flow, not trying to make it, force it, trying to control it, manipulate it, trying to hold it, uh, trying to get something out of it, trying to uh, change it or breathe like somebody else or breathe according to a recipe or when we're no, we're no longer caught in some attitude about it, when we're actually just with the normal breathing of our body, then, and we, we actually relax with that, that is a very, that is what we call bliss. The sense of a, of a self, of, of me trying to get something or control something is, has been relinquished. No longer am I trying to practice anapanasati. No longer am I trying to get samadhi. No longer am I trying to 
uh, you know, you read the meditation manuals and you and follow the directions and you form all kinds of ideas that you have to to acquire or get or attain or achieve something in order to to experience uh, something that that sounds like bliss or peace or concentration. But just the relaxation into the breath as it is, a kind of relinquishment of self into just the, the being with the flow of your normal breath is, is blissful. Whenever we do that, we experience bliss. Just on the, just on the level of being with our, with our own body, breathing. Something as simple as that, and as and as and as simple as that might sound, yet our tendency, our habit tendencies, are such that we tend to make it into very uh, kind of enormous effort, and complicated thing, and and difficult uh, attempts we make, uh, the, the kind of futile attempts we make at this to try to to get bliss. So it's not, whenever we practice in order to get bliss or get happiness, we can be rest assured that we're really not going to get it. We might get something for a moment through, through maybe some uh, fortuitous circumstances, but not through the, the, the effort uh, uh, that comes from me trying to get and attain. It's only when we relinquish that desire and forget ourselves and let go of that that we begin to to understand realize the the perfect beauty and goodness and truth that is with us all the time when we when we we no longer are trying to become or trying to get rid of things Noticed in the, in the monastic community how uh, this kind of language is certainly understood by almost everyone, I'm sure. But yet, in the daily life of the nitty-gritty of life, the, the things that happen in daily life, how easy it is to forget all that and to get caught up in in our trying to become and trying to get rid of, trying to control. Trying to get what we, something we want, trying to get rid of that which we don't like. There's a sense of our own, something's wrong with us. That there's, there's something wrong with me and I've got to, and I'm not good enough the way I am right now. And I come here to get rid of these faults and these flaws in order to sometime, if I'm, if I'm lucky and I practice hard enough, then manage to get rid of these defilements, hopefully to attain uh, a blissful state, a, peace, a peaceful heart, a sense of contentment, and all the, that we read about and hear about and feel would be, would, is what we would most like to experience on a continuous basis. Now, in monastic life, you, uh, because it is aimed at being aware and mindful around the uh, the things, the the situation, the people you're living with, and the conditions that you that surround you. You're, you're developing this attentiveness and reflectiveness on the way things are, then after a while you begin to, to see the, the futility of your life when it's based on merely trying to attain and achieve and get rid of things. Because, it, it, you know, you can, you can do that for so long and then after a while you just can't do it anymore. You, you give up. You can they go through periods where you can't stand uh, meditation, uh, where you can't stand and to hear any more Dharma talks or read any more books on Buddhism, and you you know you you 
at one time maybe you you were aspiring towards a realization of spiritual beauty and then and then through those continuous efforts and disappointment that that comes from such efforts you 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 could care less about spiritual beauty you'd like to just enjoy worldly beauty or anything that distracts or excites you to get you out of the the disappointment or the despair the disillusionment that you you're feeling so in in our meditations we do have to try and struggle and put forth this effort until we but the aim is is not to say that that is what you have to do because that's what you will do most of you will do that even with with talks like this and all the advice in the world that will be how you approach it but encouraging you to reflect upon the result of it by doing all that by by trying too hard by forcing a situation or by not bothering by taking a more uh, it doesn't matter you just must be patient and just uh, kind of relax and and uh, and then fall asleep is what happens through reflecting on that you begin to see these the the extremes that you uh, of your mind and through observing and noticing those extremities you let them go you have to recognize that those that you have to accept those extremities recognize them and through that then you the insight into relinquishing them not in a in in getting rid of out of aversion but just seeing there's no need to hang on or to to reiterate or duplicate those same things over and over again because you get the same result disappointment and despair and through that reflection on the result of your practice then more and more you you come to the middle or the the point of balance recognize that 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 that's how we have to learn through through trial and error and through being re- being fully aware of the extremities that we we go to and what is an extreme some people want uh, a lot of kind of happiness and blissful experiences they want to get the jhanas they want to get these highly concentrated states they want refined uh, conscious experiences and and so that they this if this if one's attention is toward attaining and getting these these kind of experiences the and you do get them even when you get them somehow they it's not really what you'd hope for when it was really maybe hoping to to get them where you could kind of spend long periods of time you can maybe seven days at a time in some kind of utterly blissful state and not have to to bother with the coarseness and the and the uh, trivialities and the banality of of uh, our lives as human beings but that but that is an extreme isn't it we're in the, in our human form we're not meant to live in that way for very long we can touch into it we can have flashes and moments of 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 these kind of uh, states mental states ethereal realms psychic realms all possibilities within this human form are available to us but they're flashes they're moments and then we find ourselves back here and now with this body with the breath with the with the people we're living with with the weather the way it is with the environment the way it is having to eat food prepare food eat food get dressed get undressed bathe do all the things that that human beings have to do in their lifetime on a uh, day by day this is this is this is the these are normal functions for our human state 
So in reflecting on the way it is, we're bringing, we're, we're informing ourselves of our humanity is this way. That the, the body we have and the, the realm that we're living in is this, it's this way. Not a matter of liking it, we would maybe like it to be another way. But by recognizing that it's this way, then we, we accept it, because that's the only sensible thing to do. Imagine spending your life saying, I don't want life to be this way. And that's, that's what many people do. I don't want the world to be the way it is. And I don't want you to be the way you are. And I don't want to be the way I am. I want to be something other than what I am. And I want you to be what I want you to be. And when you're not, I don't, I don't want you. And I want Britain to be a certain way. And when it's not, I'm going to just complain and complain about it and, and blame it on somebody. The planet, it's now great fun during 500 years of, of, of the white man's uh, civilizing the world. Isn't it? When Christopher Columbus discovered America, it gave the Europeans a chance to, to express themselves fully in all their wisdom. They went over to the Americas and they managed to destroy other civilizations in no time. And uh, within 500 years, uh, they, we've definitely proved our superiority, our extremity. And yet what has that done, you know, with all our conceit and arrogance and even good intentions? Because we can see it in, in, merely, in merely pejorative terms, but I'm sure a lot of people thought that they, this was a good thing. Civilizing, Christi make, uh, converting savages to Christi Christianity, all of this can be seen as a, as a very noble and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, the, the white man's burden, the, the sense of uh, noblesse oblige and, and all the, the kind of words and concepts that, that, uh, we, that we can justify what we're doing. And some of it's true, some of, of what, what uh, some of it has been very good and, and, and much of it hasn't. So we, we, we find ourselves, you know, trying to create a Christian, maybe a Christianize the world, convert everybody to, to our way of thinking, educating everybody with, with our uh, cultural attitudes, our language, our way of doing things. Uh, and even when we succeed, because it has, in many ways, this is what's happened. English is the most is 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 the uh, is a universal is a is an international language now. You go to Buddhist conferences in Korea. What do they speak? English. They can't. You know. They went to the World Fellowship of Buddhist Conference several years ago in Seoul. They had to use English. They had Mongolian monks. They had Chinese. They had Taiwanese. Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, American monks from England, English monks from America, <laughs> Vietnamese monks from America, Vietnamese monks from France, Vietnamese monks from Vietnam. <laughs> the real right kind of mixture of potpourri of, of nationalities and Races and yet the the language that had to be used for mass communication was English. Mass media with television, computers, and all the rest is is now say we're it's we we know what's happening in Yugoslavia, or what they call the former Yugoslavia. We we hear about what's happening in Somalia, and even though people don't know what to do about, it, and everybody's saying do something, but nobody quite knows how to do anything, we, we, we do hear about it and we do care about it.
So our humanity is this way, isn't it? We, when we say, just like eating and surviving, this, these, these basic needs, like in Somalia, they're just trying to survive at the lowest level of, of survival. I mean, they're not even asking for uh, three square meals a day. If they could just get one square meal a week, or even, even it doesn't have to be square. <laughs> just uh, something or other in your stomach now and then would be a great improvement. So uh, this, this is, is, is a basic necessity. We have to, have, we have to be fed. We have to uh, cooperate in order to, to take care of each other's basic needs. And we can see that, that, that this is to, to, to develop spiritually. We have to have certain foundation for that spiritual development. We do need uh, food. We need shelter. We need uh, medicines for illnesses. We need something to wear. We need basic requisites for survival before we can can really think about anything else or f find significance in anything uh, spiritual. Because this human body is this way. It needs, it needs those kind of things. Otherwise, it becomes a, too painful, too uncomfortable, too miserable a condition. So our humanity is this way. We... we we're, we're beings that live on this level of we have to have material food. We have to have things just for survival. We need to, uh, that we need to accept and not just take it for granted. Here in, in the Western world, we can, we can just think, though this is what we have all the time. We don't, doesn't, it's, it's no great problem for us. But yet in, in, in a country like this, we, we're very fortunate because we, this is, these, these basic requisites are easy enough to get. We can just take them for granted, not even bother to think about them or even notice them very much. Maybe complain about them when they aren't exactly to the standard that we would like, what we tend to do. But when we're reflecting on what we need for our spiritual development, then, then we then we're looking at it in a, in a different way, not from a standard of what we would like, but from what is necessary, uh, then, then it, that also, we're, we're not going to an extreme. We're, we're learning just the basic needs, the natural needs of, of our human form for survival, for comfort, for reasonable, reasonable amount of comfort. So that's wisdom. It's not just going into a state rejecting the body, saying, I don't want anything more to do with this horrible body, and, and trying to get into some lovely kind of mental realm where you don't have to feel uh, the hunger or the pain or the discomfort or the heaviness of your human body. That's not, that, that, that's not the way out of suffering. That's, an, that's a distraction. That's not the, the, the middle way. That is not a way of balance. And yet that's what many people try to do. Just try to avoid, try to live in a realm in which they don't have to feel very much. Now notice in, in a society also, we, it's not just physical feelings so much, but emotional needs. Isn't it? A lot of the suffering that we experience is, is on the emotional level. We feel resentful, we feel angry, we, we feel bitter, we feel uh, unloved, we can feel rejected, we can feel uh, jealous and frightened and envious and, and uh, offended. Living with each other, there's always these, these kind of emotional reactions. We, we, we affect each other very much human beings, just we, we tend to congregate together. We somehow, we, we, we might think we want to live alone to avoid all this emotional conflict, 
But in uh, but we we don't really spend all that much time alone, do we? We 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 really like to be with each other. We feel attracted to each other. And yet at the same time we exasperate, annoy and irritate each other. <laughs> the emotions are I think a very uh, something that, that many people don't fully accept and don't understand because it's, it's a bit embarrassing isn't it to have emotions and to be reasonable is very nice to be the, the kind of wise reasonable person that, that uh, that says the right things and, and does knows what to do in situations and and seems to be in control of himself or herself and and that's the, the what we'd like to be and yet we find ourselves losing control kind of breaking down uh, crying or just feeling angry over some little slight or feeling jealous over something or feeling uh, ourselves as being worthless and unlovable and these kind of emotions kind of haunt and hang around us. And yet this is, this is also a part of our humanity. These, these kind of things, these kind of feelings can also be seen as a part of our practice of Dhamma, not just suppressed, denied, rejected, but to be seen in terms of what they really are that when we integrate these emotions then that's our energy it's our it, it gives us energy and by to live our lives to develop spiritually so our emotional our emotions rather than need, than being judged or being controlled, or being uh, re uh, suppressed, are integrated through mindfulness and through understanding them. And I think that's uh, many, many, much of modern psychology is is increasingly aware of this because. Uh, I think in, in, in countries like this uh, that have developed uh, uh, their intellects to a high level and uh, their ability to think and be reasonable and rational, oftentimes at the, the uh, repression and rejection of the emotions. And so the, the problems, the suffering that people have is, is, is very emotional. And yet these are very important conditions to understand and to integrate into one's experience of life. And how do you do it? You can't just... Emotions are the way they are. You can't say, I want only these kind of emotions. You just get what you happen to get. We don't like to have, you know, have wonderful, you know, when we see things... Uh, uh, when, when difficult scenes arise, we'd like to respond in a noble and reasonable, sensible, mature way. And we generally tend to, at least try to, and oftentimes not really admit how we're feeling. It's interesting to see how, how we can put on a good face, a stiff upper lip, a kind of good front, and and, and 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 maybe look quite good in public, but inside, underneath that, is all, all kinds of other things that you don't want anyone to know about, and even yourself. And it's those those kind of those kind of feelings that we need to to uh, integrate through accepting them, through mere acceptance, through. Through feeling them, through willing to feel those those kind of emotions, which isn't indulging in them, kind of wallowing in them, but 
go into the actual feeling of them, to feel the suffering or the the feeling of anger or feeling of jealousy or fear or rejection or or being offended, willing to fully accept that as a feeling, then it integrates into uh, into your life. It gives you energy. It it helps to balance you, gives you strength and wisdom to be able to to keep learning from and, and, and using what you're feeling, what you're experiencing for developing the Eightfold Path. Because the Eightfold Path of the Fourth Noble Truth is, is the way of balance. It's a, it, even though it's how, when we give it the, the title Eightfold, it does sound complicated. Number eight. I think, what is the what is the first one? What is the fifth one? And so forth. We get tangled up with with the, with the folds of the path. When really it means balance, isn't it? It means being able to to be here and now, and with what the way it is, and as we're as each one of us is experiencing it. Even even if you're if you're in in a terrible state right now, you're totally confused and totally miserable and yet you're accepting that misery at least maybe you're 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 noticing it you're willing to feel it you're willing to be have that feeling rather than than trying to get rid of it or ignore it through that kind of patient endurance and acceptance then that that feeling dissolves, it's impermanent, it disappears. And that is, is what, what I say is developing the Eightfold Path because more and more you, you, you feel this sense of balance, of proportion, of, of confidence, of inner strength. There's something in you is, you, you realize within you is something, is that which is very pure, very beautiful, very good, very true, and it's not just something that's going to change according to, to the weather or to the age or to the company or the place or whatever that you have, that, that, that these things do change and they're always uh, unpredictable. Amravati, we've we try uh, being a Buddhist monk I don't have to do any of the cooking it's not that I don't want to because I I used to be I used to think of myself as a good cook when I was a layman uh, and I liked cooking uh, so it's not me kind of shove this duty off onto the the Anagarikas or the lay people it's just the part of the convention of Theravada monasticism. But you hear these reports of what goes on in the kitchen, Madame Ravati. <laughs> and uh, and all, most of them aren't all that promising. <laughs> the food generally quite good, but but then the uh, but then the emotions that have gone into making this food sometimes have been anything but good. Because obviously working in a, in a kitchen and, having, and preparing things and being in charge or being a worker, being something or other, uh, will bring up various uh, feelings of, of, uh, that one has, you know, about being, uh, say, if, you're, if you have somebody who's a who's an expert professional cook and they're asked to go and help some the, the chief cook who might be a, an amateur not a very good cook then the professional cook can get very offended by what they see the the head cook doing uh, or people have various views about how to cook food and what the sangha should have and and other people have, you know the, this is a, a very fraught subject when you get into food you're, the, the passions are easily aroused Food brings up all kinds of emotions. 
So it is, it can be seen as an opportunity to, to learn and to resolve these kind of emotions. This is what I've been trying to encourage the cooks here at Amavachi to do. I don't know if they believe me or not, but it, it certainly, uh, you know, even though they, they want to, I just want to get out of the kitchen and go off to the retreat center and have some space, fair enough. But that's not really what you need to do, maybe. If, you, if, you, if, you're really, uh, if you really can't cope with the kitchen, it's, then re- recognize the kitchen may be something that you need to, to investigate more and learn how to, how to, to accept and to resolve your feelings, the, the, the hot passions, emotions that, that are aroused through those kind of duties or that, that kind of activity. When we do that, then, then we find out we have, we, can t- we, we really learn and strengthen ourselves in, in these kind of, through, through doing these kind of ordinary things. The danger is to think, well, I want to become a monk or a sealer, or I don't have to do this anymore because it interferes with my practice. And the way of getting out of it, avoiding it, it's not spiritual. Cooking food is, is mundane. It brings up all kinds of worldly emotions. It, it's a hassle. And I just can hardly wait till they give me the higher ordinations where I can get out of that kitchen Go in and do a puja now and then, kind of chant a nice mantra over the, over the stove, and then get out and let them, let them go to it. Because that is wanting to get away from something rather than, than uh, seeing that desire to get away is, is the real problem. Or wanting something, wanting, not wanting... The, uh, to have the feelings you have when you're in, in uh, when you're working in the kitchen. Notice that in in your own life, whatever work you do and people you're living with, you can begin to at least notice what you're feeling. Not judging what you're feeling, but beginning to notice. It feels this way. There's this kind of feeling in my mind. It feels like this. And by, by that kind of reflection, then you, something in you feels it's all right then to feel that way. It's okay. Everything is all right. You don't have to control and manipulate. You don't have to kind of spend all your time trying to, to get something or get rid of something. You have more confidence in just being with your life in whatever conditions, whatever forms that you happen to be with in, in the here and the now. Being a head monk, for example, it's working through the, 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 uh, the kind of emotions that come from having responsibilities and everybody, and, and you know, wanting to, to do a good job and be responsible and not, not mess, make a mess of it. And, all these these kind of feelings come up in the mind, and then you, but you begin to accept those feelings, and then when you do make a mess of things, that's okay too. You can accept your, the resp- the feelings of responsibility. You can accept the accept the feelings of of failing, uh, and of uh, you can accept the feelings of of that come from disappointing other people. Because, you know, one doesn't want to disappoint. One wants to encourage faith in people that come here so that they, they have trust and faith in the Sangha and, and in Buddhism and they'll practice it and develop. It's all very good stuff. But inevitably people get disillusioned and, and you disappoint them. And, but that's all right too. Because if that's what you feel, the feeling that, that people have been disappointed with you, then it feels this way. It feels just this way. And then that, and in that reflection, that, that feeling is integrated. It's, it's energizing you. It gives you, it gives you uh, effort to keep going. Where if you, if you get caught in, 
in self-pity or resentment, then you're shutting yourself off again. You're going to get weak and sickly and enervated and, and depressed because you're, 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 tr you're closing yourself down. You're not, you're the, the, the things that, that you're feeling are not being integrated. They're merely being controlled. And that control will always weaken you and make you and f make you feel tired and fed up and despairing and exhausted. Just just thinking negatively, even after a good night's rest, makes you can make you feel totally exhausted. I can think totally exhausting thoughts. That when I think them, I'm totally exhausted at that moment. <laughs> Even though I'm not totally exhausted, I'm totally exhausted. <laughs> That's the power of thought. And, and uh, it, it is powerful. Our thoughts are very powerful. So don't, you know, what you do think is, is, is to, be, to, to be recognized and to be accepted rather than judged, controlled, suppressed, exaggerated, all the rest of it that, that, that is the madness that goes on in this human realm. So I think that's enough for the formal talk this afternoon and time for tea, three, five after three. I invite you all for a cup of tea and then in, a, in about 15 minutes we can reassemble for questions. <laughs>